And the fir first presentation from the Atmosphere Group, Shao Cheng and Susanna. I'll give you a warning one minute before, and then I'll let you know at eight minutes. So thank you, Chris. Um, Susanna and I have put a few slides together to give you a brief update on what's uh, going on with the uh, phase three atmosphere group and also what uh, our future plan is. Um, so as you know, the main goal for the atmosphere group is uh, to develop the low rise East Rise M for various East Rise M scientific applications. So our current effort is on the development of the V3 atmosphere uh, model and also uh, working with the coupled group to get the V3 East Rise M uh, completed by the end of this year. Uh, like I mentioned last year, after more than four years, uh, uh, major model development efforts, we have uh, success, uh, successfully uh, developed, uh, introduced 11 new features that uh, representing a significant up, update of the current atmospheric physics for Israel SM. Uh, those 11 features uh, were made in improving the representation of atmospheric chemistry, aerosol, uh, cloud, and the convection. This is a really uh, uh, big update for the atmosphere physics for Israel SM atmospheric model. Uh, we have successfully delivered uh, the, the version of new V3 atmosphere to the coupled group. Right now, we work with them very closely, uh, try to address any issues we may find after we coupling this uh, atmosphere component with other Earth system component. Uh, like I mentioned, and also Chris also mentioned yesterday, uh, with the new uh, atmospheric physics, we see uh, we are comparable or slightly better uh, compared to the current V2 model for the mean state, but we show clear improvement in the tropical variability and the dyno cycle. I'm going to show a few slides, uh, a few examples in my next slides. Uh, so uh, our current effort, like I said, we working with the cobalt group to refine the new atmospheric model uh, based on the feedback from the couple simulations. So uh, this slide gave you some example about the uh, V3 atmospheric simulation fidelity. So this is uh, based on our most recent smoke test we made just a uh, few days ago. So the first figure shows uh, the simulated mean state, this is the comparison of root mean square error uh, with the CMAX-6 ensembles from different version of uh, Israel SM uh, models. So probably you can now see uh, the detailed information clearly, uh, but if you look at the sum I plus, the, uh, the plus sign means the V3 atmosphere is better than the default V2. The minor sign means we are worse, and the tilt means we are comparable. You can see for most of the field, uh, I summarize in this figure, uh, we show slightly better uh, improvement compared to the default V2, that including the long wave cloud radiative forcing, the surface uh, precipitation, uh, the surface temperature over land, uh, the sea level pressure, and also the Zunoven 8, uh, 850. But we do see uh, quite a uh, large degradation in the short wave cloud forcing that also leads to some issues with uh, uh, the night uh, TOA bar date. And also we also see some degradation in the 500 potential height. We are addressing those issues uh, with the coupled team during the coupled integration. So this figure gave you uh, uh, some idea about you know, uh, the improvement we made in the tropical variability. You can see compared to the trim observations, the V2, the current wave is too weak, and also the 
uh, like the MDO is also too weak. Those kind of issues has nicely improved by using the new atmospheric V3 model. You can see we almost, uh, uh, you know, perfectly reproduce the current wave compared to the trim observation. This, and, and also I have to see those kind of Im improvement is uh, very robust, uh, even with, you know, different tuning, uh, we still can retain those kind of improvement. This is a very encouraging result. We are very happy with that. Uh, for the dyno cycle, uh, so as you know, uh, uh, for V2 model, after we introduced the new convective trigger, we already uh, made quite a large improvement in dyno cycle, but we do find uh, in V2 model, the dyno cycle, the phase, usually they peak a few hours later compared to the observation. Uh, the phase showing on the color, if you compare, you know, the color between the Trim, this is the observation we use of V2 and V3. You can see V3 is much, much closer to what you see in the trim observations. We also found uh, with the new atmosphere uh, physics, we also in, uh, largely input the amplitude of dyno cycle. This is really hard to make uh, for our earlier version of ESRSM. So uh, our next emphasis after the V3 freeze uh, will be cover uh, few areas. Uh, those things are still under discussion, has not been uh, finalized. So why is we will continue to maintain the Israel SM V3 atmosphere model and the support the, science, uh, the need from the science groups? We also need to uh, write the documentations to describe this model. But our major effort would be trans transition to the low rise ESM, uh, Israel SM V4 using the EMAXX C plus code base with the needed uh, physical parameterizations in order to make EMAXX can be applied for the low rise applications. So this is uh, uh, based on the priority set by the Israel SM, like Dave showed yesterday, the, the Israel SM V4 will be the center of connected scientific co ecosystem for understanding and modeling the Earth system. So uh, by achieving that goal, we also need the low rise Israel uh, for the V4, uh, our next generation models. Here are a couple of ideas we have, uh, what we could do, but those things are still under discussion. Uh, we probably uh, will finalize in the next uh, couple of months, I believe. Uh, those work will, you know, uh, need a very close collaboration with both the EMAXX group and also the Cabot group. So I just need a few things we could do. Uh, one is uh, actually based, based on the idea from Chris Gallas. We probably can test uh, the EMAXX high resolution, the screen uh, for the low rise, uh, coupling with the low rise Israel and V3 physics. Uh, those will be a hybrid C++ and the Fortran code for con concept approval and also for better understanding what needed for the low rise uh, Israel SMV4. Uh, this is one idea. We also see some inconsistencies in representing the cloud microphysics uh, between the Emacs, uh, XX, the high rise and also the low rise. And also we need, because this model will be used uh, uh, for different uh, scale, so we need to improve the scale awareness. Uh, we also need to make sure shark will work well with uh, ZM, the deep convection, when we use screen for uh, the high rise, uh, for the low rise applications. So there are some other things we need to do. Uh, I just want to show you one figure uh, regarding how shark and the ZM uh, are working in the current uh, Israel SM. This is the uh, annual mean low rise cloud bears relative to Calypso uh, with using the cloud, uh, the cost of the simulator package. You can see the up panel is default V2, the uh, middle one is uh, V2 with P3, uh, P3, and the lower one we use the shark to replace cloud. You can see we still a lot of work to do. The, they produce uh, much larger errors in almost globally, uh, we definitely need to retune this, uh, improve this coupling. So this is the timeline. Uh, we are going to work with the couple team to get the V3 freeze by end of this year. 
And uh, for the next two years, our major emphasis will be transition to ESRSM before low rise model. That's it. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I'm sure we do. It's early on. Hmm? Yeah, more like a, clarific a clarification question. So uh, for uh, EMV4 in Fortran, right? So we will have two words like uh, EMV4 in Fortran low rise and Scream <coughs> Emacs in low rise. Uh, I think for the V4. Okay, if no other question, let's move on to the second talk. Now moving on to EMXX, Peter Coldwell and Susanna Burroughs. So I'm going to talk about the E3SM atmosphere model uh, in C++ or EMXX, which you've already heard a bunch about. Uh, so you'd probably not be surprised uh, that it is E3SM's new atmosphere model. And it was written in C++ using the Cocos library for both performance portability, uh, so the fact that we need to be able to run on GPUs and CPUs. And uh, hopefully it's going to give us a future thing in terms of whatever comes next. It's very well supported. Uh, it also gives us hierarchical parallelism, so more opportunities uh, for speed up than we got with the old uh, version of the model, so nested parallelism. And why we actually need to make this switch, uh, it's actually really important because all of DOE's leadership computing facilities use GPUs now, and so a lot of our uh, core hours. So I think that Mark showed like there's something like 1 billion GPU core hours and, and a very, very small fraction of that on CPUs coming up. And uh, just in terms of buying our own machines, it's going to be harder and harder to get very good performant machines without GPUs as well. So this is a change we need to make uh, just based on architectures. Uh, we also, uh, I think, as you know, are having a huge pivot to very high resolution right now within E3SM and within the uh, persistent modeling community in general. And uh, GPUs really make this uh, kilometer scale modeling much, much easier because you just have so much parallelism uh, that you need to exploit. Uh, and then the third reason is just that uh, it was a really great opportunity to get out from under that legacy CESM based code. So pocket PBUF here, uh, and really kind of move towards being able to do unit testing and much more modern software engineering. So uh, a good thing for the project to do. In terms of the status of the project, so the uh, kilometer scale model uh, has been done for six months now. Uh, at least we have a, a version, although I will say that it hasn't really been publicly released uh, in the sense that we don't really have the bandwidth to do a lot of support for it. It's also rapidly evolving right now. So this is a brand new uh, baby model and uh, we haven't had any opportunities to really do much evaluation, certainly no tuning, things like that. So there's a lot of uh, room for rapid improvement. It's not a perfect model at this point. So a lot more work to be done. Uh, in terms of the low res model, you just heard a little bit about that from Xiao Cheng. I think it's probably not going to be ready for a couple of years, at least. Um, so we need a convection scheme, gravity wave drag, uh, and uh, a lot of tuning and uh, uh, improvement sorts of things. Um, uh, in terms of tools, uh, I'll talk a little bit more on the, the last slide, but we have uh, some opportunities to make this uh, actually affordable to the, the mortal man here. Uh, so you can use a doubly periodic version of the model. You can use a regional refinement, things like that. We are currently in the process of porting that from uh, our prototype Fortran version into uh, C++. So, so to talk a little bit more about the version that we already have done, the, the uh, kilometer scale version. So this is uh, 
what we call SCREAM, Impl Cloud Resolving E3SM Atmosphere Model. And so uh, it is just the high resolution configuration of the EMXX code base, right? Um, and so we uh, have already done a few runs. So we first did a 40 day uh, simulation that was contributed to the Diamond 2 Inter Comparison. And that was using the uh, Fortran prototype version of the model. So it ran much slower, but uh, uh, gave us very similar answers to, to the new C++ version. Uh, so data from that is publicly available now if you want. And then after that, we uh, got the C++ model running and we were able to do four 40-day simulations, one for each season of the year. And uh, we're currently writing the overview paper for that. And so the data from that will be available once that's done. And so just to uh, brag a little bit, uh, the, uh, the Four Seasons runs ran 10 times faster than the Fortran prototype. So this was both due to being able to use GPUs and the fact that we are able to use a bigger machine because all the big machines use GPUs. So uh, we have an ambitious plan in terms of the next couple of years that uh, hopefully you guys will get excited about, get involved with. Uh, we have first we're trying to do these so-called CES simulations uh, this year so that's a 13-month current climate simulation and then a 13-month simulation where we've just raised the SST by 4k everywhere that allows you to get a sense of your climate sensitivity and net feedback uh, and so we have an inside allocation to do that this year we're hoping to start a simulation quite soon with that uh, uh, we also hope, uh, more aspirational I think, but I think we'll probably do it, uh, to do uh, an aerosol sensitivity simulation as well. So 13 months uh, nudge to meteorology for uh, current climate and uh, pre-industrial aerosols. Um, and then next year, I just wrote the proposal for doing a 10 to 20 year AMIP simulation. This will be the first time that's ever been done at this resolution. And a 10 to 20 year simulation uh, that where we're going to use that AMIP simulation, but uh, plus a, a, a patterned SST increase and also a CO2 a greenhouse gas uh, increase that's uh, commensurate. So trying to do our best job at uh, getting a climate change simulation for 10 to 20 years so we can get some uh, interannual variability. Um, and uh, so that's going to be a really exciting data set, I think, as well. And then uh, in the last year of phase three, we're planning on doing a coupled simulation at least a year in length. So, <clears throat> so in terms of what's in Scream, uh, we don't have parameterized deep convection anyways. We're using the simplified higher order closure or shock for uh, our turbulence and cloud scheme. This uh, allows for skewed distribution, so it should be able to handle implicitly a shallow convection. Uh, we're prescribing aerosols in this simulation, but there's a whole project called Eagles that is de delivering a uh, prognostic aerosol uh, capability for us based on the, the MAM scheme that, that we all uh, know. Uh, and uh, we're using a non hydrostatic version of the spectral element DICOR that we've been using in E3SM since the beginning. Same ish P3 scheme that uh, V3 uh, is going to use. And we're using the most modern version of our TMGP um, ported to C. There are a number of things that we uh, need to clean up. As I said, this is a baby model. Uh, so a uh, number of precipitation biases I'm not going to go into. Uh, right now we have, uh, it's several degrees too warm over land, particularly at night. We've traced this back to a stable boundary layer issue. We know how to fix it, but we just need time. Um, we have extreme cold snaps that are unearthly uh, in the model um, that we also, uh, we have a workaround for, but uh, we need to actually do some uh, real digging into. And in the deep tropics, uh, our convection isn't aggregating in a reasonable way. It's uh, very isolated popcorn. So another uh, item that we could use help on. Um, and so then uh, it's uh, about eight minutes past. So I think I'm going to stop. But uh, just to point out, as I said before, that we have these tools that uh, make it really computationally efficient and, and quick to uh, get solutions. They seem to have a good um, relationship to the behavior of the full model as well. So I'll take questions. Thanks.
easy question. Those uh, satellite pictures you had, were those events you actually tried to mimic? Was that just there was an event in the satellite record that looked similar to something that came out of the code? So this is, I think, something like a 40 day, 48 hour uh, a forecast prediction or not timecast prediction. Um, so yeah, so uh, after 48 hours, we're still able to simulate the exact same events. So just looking at satellite versus observed satellite versus model for that. I see. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Just a comment. Uh, the 10 year simulations are um, excellent. Uh, It'll be an excellent resource. Was wondering about the resolution of it. Is it three or are you going down further? Yeah, that's a great question. So definitely this simulation is going to be the three kilometers. Um, we haven't uh, uh, we haven't really started playing around with changing the resolution. Um, we have a paper that just got accepted yesterday where we're using the doubly periodic approach to look at the horizontal resolution sensitivity. And it looks like we get uh, in, except for shallow convection areas, we get very similar answers, regardless of whether we use one kilometer or five kilometer resolution. So I'm actually a little bit more inclined to uh, increase the resolution of five kilometers because we can get more throughput, but we're not going to do that uh, uh, in the planned future. So that's- And no. is it one simulation or like three simulations at least? I mean, are you trying to create a small, very tiny ensemble? I wish. Uh, yeah, it's just one simulation for this, just trying to run as long as we possibly can with that one simulation. Yeah. And the last thing, um, for IT, for the biases, have you considered using the capped formulation to correct biases? Yeah. Um, so we do use, uh, well, uh, I would say, so capped, I see, is doing forecast simulations, but not just doing one forecast, you're doing like a whole worth of forecasts to get kind of the climatology of your forecast biases. And so we haven't used capped in that sense, but we use forecasts a lot because it's so expensive to analyze them, to do simulations that uh, really doing short simulations, looking at your bias is, is the way to go. So yeah, we do that. Okay, one last question. Um, yeah, um, I have a question about uh, so team on the aerosol sensitivity test. Um, are you going to use the um, prescribed aerosol for the simple test? Yeah, yeah. And so then I want to comment that uh, actually um, we showed that many years ago um, it will give very different aerosol impact compared to prognostic, prognostic approach for aerosols. Um, um, but on the eagles, I have uh, incorporated a simplified prognostic aerosol for the aerosol crowd interaction, um, which maybe, you know, we can use that. We can discuss later, but just the comment on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to talk more about it. Um, we do have an interest in understanding our prognostic or, or our uh, um, we do have an interest in understanding our prescribed aerosol model, and so there is some value to that. But yeah, it, of course, it's going to be different than a prognostic scheme. So um, yeah, we should talk about it. Okay, thank you, Peter. In the interest of time, let's switch to the next talk. Peter Thompson and Gautam Bish on the land component. Okay, yeah. So acknowledge the contributions of uh, the large team of EPIC leads that we've got for the for the land project and uh, they've all made important contributions through the year and to this presentation. We've got nine active EPICs uh, including development in ELM and MOSART as well as connections to GCAM and we are taking our marching orders for development in terms of requirements from the coupled modeling groups and then providing hopefully good capability back to those groups. Uh, one of our main objectives now is preparing the configuration for the V3 coupled simulations, and at the same time, we're identifying and addressing major model biases, particularly in the area of hydrology, and including runoff and, uh, and groundwater biases. 
The development of the and, and optimization of our ultra high resolution land one kilometer simulation is ongoing. I'll show you a little bit more about that. And we are in the in the process of merging all of our kind of variety of diagnostics into the E3SM unified framework. We hope to have a full documentation of this of the V3 model uh, well underway in phase three, hopefully completed. And we do have some changes in scope for FY24 and 25 based on priorities. I will go quickly some results from each of the uh, major epics, and then I'll encourage you to talk with people uh, afterwards to get some, some further detail because we do have none of these, and I'll go pretty quickly. So in terms of development of the FATES model, the uh, connection of FATES to ELM, that's uh, underway in reduced complexity modes at the moment uh, to do some sanity tests, for uh, example, under a satellite phenology configuration as well as a fixed biogeography configuration that allows some additional constraints on the behavior of the model uh, to, to assess individual components as we progress with that. And um, as well as some, some implementation of global wood harvesting data sets and evaluation of these steps within the ILAM framework. We are as well developing the redox biogeochemistry, which is uh, missing entirely from ELM. So this is anaerobic biogeochemistry that's important uh, all over the world and especially in wetland systems. And we're using the PFLOTRAN reaction engine to do that. It includes aqueous biogeochemistry as well as the solid phase aerobic litter and soil decomposition cascade that's currently in ELM. And this is uh, going through the alchemia interface, which comes from uh, other BER investments, and is a, a very broad collaboration with NG Arctic, Compass, FME, Compass, GLM, and additional projects, and a few papers there uh, documenting the progress there. In terms of our crop model, new development and testing is underway. The flow of agricultural nitrogen capability is, is implemented, as well as uh, winter wheat capability, and those are both being uh, tested and papers developed to analyze that. And this is also helping the connection with GCAM. In terms of the Mozart GCAM coupling, so this is the river and human system coupling, there is already a two-way coupling between ELM and Mozart through the irrigation capability uh, that ELM can provide irrigation demand to Mozart, which then provides an irrigation supply back to ELM. That's being expanded now to include the GCAM uh, component where non-irrigation demand can also be added into that Mozart framework. And uh, in addition to the irrigation supply, the surface water supply deficit can be passed back to GCAM, which ends up modifying its uh, simulation of energy system development. The wildfire topic is is on this is work that Qingju is leading, and the goals here are to improve all aspects of the fire parameterization, including ignition, duration, and using a machine learning approach and integrating with a number of different data sets that you can see listed here, and uh, using machine learning generated surrogate models to, uh, to impl implement the wildfire model and uh, doing fine tuning of the parameterizations of that uh, of that model as it gets integrated into ELM. I mentioned the diagnostics. Uh, we have a wide range of you know, homegrown diagnostic packages that have evolved with ELM and previously with CLM over the years. And this includes the uh, standard kind of time series and mapping diagnostics, as well as the ILAM package. All of that is being rolled into the E3SM Diags package and Zippy, and uh, numerous people are working toward that, and Xiaoying Shi is leading that effort. In the past, you've heard uh, us describe the uncertainty quantification capability within ELM. That's a very mature capability now that's uh, uh, Kachik, Sargzi, and Rashudo have been developing for a number of years. They're now able to apply that regularly for uh, evaluating ELM ensembles against uh, various observational frameworks. And so they're doing parameter sensitivity analysis as well as parameter optimization studies and showing you a couple of examples 
of uh, the ability using that framework to get much improved uh, representation of processes such as gross primary productivity against flux measurements at a large scale in an efficient way. And we're also using that same surrogate uh, neural network machine learning surrogate framework now in an exploratory mode to improve the, res uh, the spin up speed, the spin speed to spin up for the high resolution ELM simulations. Uh, we, we still need to spin up these bi chemistry simulations and when we have 20 plus million grid cells for just the North American domain, uh, that problem becomes uh, really important to, to try to reduce the, the time to solution not to test this out there. In terms of the GPU code development and continuous integration, the major uh, new effort recently has been the development of an automated code generation tool called Spell, software tool for porting ELM. It does quite a few things. It parses the code, determines its input and output parameterizations, uh, performs uh, reference simulations with the standard code, creates unit test packages, uh, offloads that to the GPU, and then does op optimization on in an automated code generation, be able to implement individual modules, test that on the GPU, and then bring that back into um, uh, a, co a combined framework outside of the unit testing framework. And we've now been able to use uh, that package to generate the complete end-to-end -end implementation of ELM on the GPU, except for the things that the CPU has to do, like I.O. And that's work that Dolly Wang and Peter Schwartz have been pushing forward. I'll end uh, the list of our current work with this, just to say that there are a number of different software integration capabilities and, and tasks that are ongoing. I won't try to read through all of these, uh, but we are integrating new features and identifying bugs and fi fixing them as they come up. Ongoing interaction integration with a number of ecosystem projects, including NG Tropics and NG Arctic. Our priorities for the, re uh, the rest of phase three are, as I said, to deliver a tested and robust version three model configuration for the coupled simulations and to document that model as thoroughly as possible in this time frame. Uh, we will have our continental scale ultra high resolution land simulations running on GPU at, at kind of production scale hopefully before the summit platform uh, goes away, and uh, preparing codes then for next Exascale machines as we look forward to the V4 campaigns, and ongoing work to first identify and then fix hydrology biases, uh, and hopefully end up with a fully integrated set of diagnostics for the model by the end of phase three. Thanks. There. Any question, Dave? So, Microphone. So, said before summit goes away. Well, you said before summit goes away. Why aren't you just working on frontier then? We are doing that too. Yeah. Okay. So, well, we, we don't want to waste the the opportunity to use summit, and it it'll, it'll be at least September, and we're we're using it now. Uh, but at the same time, yes, we're developing and testing on the on Frontier and its um, front end test platform. Um, have you tried running the the GPU land with the GPU atmosphere yet? No, we haven't. Although we've talked with Peter about doing that, it's on our list of things to do. We're getting close, I think, to to being able to to flip the switch on that. Yeah. I wanted to ask about. I was really excited you mentioned documentation uh, and. I'm curious whether you just took it upon your own group to create this documentation or whether all of the uh, different components are going to have documentation for V3. Well, you could tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, it's just it's, so, it's such a critical need uh, in the community and it, you know, we're way past the point where we can and should be relying on the old technic tech notes from NCAR to to support our documentation needs, which is what we've been doing. And uh, so we just have to put the time in and it's going to take time and effort and it's not going to be a fun thing to do, but uh, we will have a good result. And my intent is to have it be an online 
easily refreshable kind of a framework. And I'm anxious to get people's ideas about what's the best way to do that. Or it's going to be a topic of our breakout this afternoon. Yeah. So this is a tech doc rather than a user guide, right? It should be both. Okay. Yeah. Great. And a flow chart of, of all the, the calling tree and all the input and output variables and names and units and all of that in an online framework is my dream for it. Yeah, Peter, thanks for bringing this up. I just wanted to add to what you just said to say that if this is a critical need, I feel not only for the community, but also within the project. When I look around, I think within the last, uh, I don't know what, well, actually, I, I, maybe we can see a show of hands. How many people here are Ethereum project team members who've joined within the last five years? There we go. And every time that we bring a new person, that's about half of the room. Every time we bring a new person into the project, we have to uh, either have someone sit down with them and instruct them one at a time, or they are kind of left to their own devices to figure things out on their own. Neither of these is an efficient way of onboarding new people into understanding our code and how to work with it. So the, the documentation is critical for our own internal use also. I think that's very important for us to understand. Couldn't agree more. I just want to mention that the infrastructure breakout yesterday, we started talking about how, uh, how we could set up a system for all the components to write their documents and get it. Cool. <laughs> okay. Last question. So, I've seen this movie before. We talk about this every meeting. We talk about our plans, how we're going to improve our documentation, and we get overwhelmed by development. The documentation never gets done. Which, if people they know from my one-on-one -on -one calls that I'm pretty adamant about this. This needs to be. I ended up. Myself, reinforcing Susanna's point, had to call Gatam to find out what the output is from CLM, ELM, because it wasn't in the CLM documentation. So um, I think after we go back to where we came from after this meeting, we need to follow through. And um, maybe it's like the lab with safety. I'm going to have to start off every one on one meeting with where's the house of documentation coming. Yeah, I, I think it's a good plan. Uh, and I mean, the, the prioritization for FY 24 and 25 that was provided to the to the whole project actually makes space in some ways for us to do that. Uh, and we intend to take advantage of that space and get busy. Okay, thank you, Peter. The next talk is on Omega. Luke. Well, I'll give the Omega update here, mostly talking about the, the overview plan and a little bit of a progress update at the very end. But a reminder for those new, Omega is a project to rewrite the ocean model as it stands, MPAS Ocean. But an important point to clarify is that it is MPAS Ocean at its core. It's retaining the MPAS mesh specification and the discretization. It's just for increased performance on GPU resources. Um, so some of the reasons to do this relate to some things that were built into the MPAS Ocean code such as the framework not being well designed for multiple data spaces, GPU versus CPU. These are things within the code, like the registry and how we allocate things. The tracer group implementation is hard to move to the device because of lots and lots of data transfers. Um, there's some loop ordering issues that we have to take care of. But this also gives us a chance to reevaluate some of our implementations that are probably causing us some issues as of now, such as mesoskeletes, vertical mixing, and we could also, we're also looking at uh, the surface gravity wave modeling. So the approach we're taking here is to use YACL, uh, this uh, capability, kind of like Cocos, but uh, much smaller and lighter. Um, it gets us uh, performance portability, but it also allows us to maintain some simplicity and ease of porting to train some of the uh, Fortran folks to be more easily onboarded into the C++ world. Um, I think I'll just leave it there.
One thing I really do want to stress uh, in terms of what Omega is trying to be is what the resolution vision is. We're not targeting 60 to 30 anymore with resolution down to 10 or 8 kilometers. Instead, what we're targeting is like an 18 to 6 background state as the default with resolution that could go down to say two kilometers or five kilometers in something like the Gulf of Mexico. So an example is shown here uh, from the ICOM project where they created 125 meters around Delaware Bay. So we could go from an eddy mostly resolving configuration to very, very high resolution um, toward a coastal problem. This allows us to more effectively use GPU. It gives us more work to do on the GPU. <coughs> It also gets us out of this mesoscale eddy gray zone where we're kind of resolving the eddies, but not quite. So we can actually just resolve the mesoscale eddies and not have to think real hard about how to transition. From the wave point of view, um, it is like the community standard. It's, it's sort of a gold standard wave model, but it is not optimal for long-term integration in particular climate scale problems. We have found effective GPU, GPU usage is very challenging. We've spent uh, quite a bit of time moving some source terms to the GPU and have found some performance improvement, but not as much as we like. And to get that performance, we would have to start over. And it would be a really massive undertaking. So we're thinking about two paths right now. Using the WaveWatch 3 code as is for highly detailed coastal simulations, but exploring the use of AI to do some emulation of these very expensive source terms for a longer term integration. So as we've started to build up Omega here, one thing that's really been working quite well, I think, is we've, we've had a lot of uh, buy-in across the Omega team. As we've developed design documents uh, in the bottom right here, we have our repository set up that the entire team has contributed to how this should be structured. Every design document that goes in, I'm seeing comments from across the groups, from the group. So there's a really good discussion and going forward as a team, not just laying down what things are, but still going in a, in a direction that's very helpful to the overall project. Um, some of our, our goals here are to have documentation uh, for the entire model, not for MPAS Ocean itself. We're moving forward to documenting Omega. Everything that goes in is going to have documentation. We have a skeleton in place, uh, as you can see in the upper right already, sort of a read the docs approach that um, Zyler S.A. Davis has put together. Um, we've set up the structure. We're having tests that go with every single development. Uh, but also allowing for rapid prototyping. And we have all of this documented on Confluence as to what, what the plan of attack is. One of our big um, efforts recently was to sponsor a hackathon for test development across Omega. This actually served a fair chunk of the project. We had people working on polar process tests BGC, we had some HES testing developed during this hackathon. Um, but most of it was Omega focused. So seven out of nine uh, participants were working on Omega. And I should mention this was put on by um, Zyler and Carolyn Lanel spent a lot of effort putting this together. And I sounds like it went really well. A lot of test case got done. We have now have some inertial gravity wave testing. Uh, to verify linear momentum discretization. We have some manufactured solution testings, um, a global nonlinear geostrophic test for convergence operators. Looks like the bottom's getting cut off here. And then an unstable jet test so, and allowing us to benchmark against other models as well. So a couple examples that come out here, and this is all under what's called the Polaris framework. So this, for who don't know, Compass is how we've tested the ocean model before. Polaris is its successor, which is right now mostly the same, except for it has increased parallelism, so it's more efficient as well. And I should mention at the last about testing. All of this testing was developed for MPES Ocean, but as we've designed the documents, we're very 
very confident that this is easily ported to Omega and extended when that is ready. One last progress item to date to note here is that a lot of the design documents are in place for the infrastructure. We're waiting on the last couple to be finalized and then the, the development of the infrastructure proceeds from there. Like I mentioned, we have a skeleton documentation capability in place and documentation is starting to flow with the new features. Uh, we've also conducted a very deep review of the MPAS OSHA numerical formulation, um, mostly led by Mark, uh, Zeiler, and Darren, and Hewn from Oak Ridge as well. Um, we now have pretty increased confidence in how it's implemented. There's also been some nice work on reduction of vertical velocity noise in the simulations. An example of discretization of I don't exactly remember where in this is, but you can see there's a lot of almost grid scale noise in the vertical velocity. With this new discretization, we're able to reduce this quite a bit. Uh, interestingly, um, it doesn't actually affect the climate too much, but it's really, really nice to make this written as well. As I said, we've, we've developed a number of tests as well, and those continue to be developed so we can have sufficient testing in place as the code comes online. And we also now do have our first piece of code as a pull request in place. So just getting started, but a lot of good progress so far. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Luke. Do we have questions? I had a question on the resolution at the beginning. Yep. So you said down to two-ish kilometers. I just wanted to maybe get some clarification. This is still only like continental shelf scale. Yes. You're not talking about going down so small resolution that you're not up into to like that right now. Okay, thanks. That, that I would say is a capability that ICOM is working on from like a storm surge barotropic type configuration. I don't know. I see Darren has a microphone. Maybe he wants to add. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly the same thing. Uh, so th thanks for clarifying. I, I know there's been confusion on this in the past, and it comes down to the kind of physics that we're resolving. Uh, so the kind of work that we're doing in ICOM uses a simplified version of the ocean. It's just a 2D solver, uh, and that's where 100 meter resolution is possible. Uh, so exactly what Steve was talking about before, uh, the kind of mesoscale resolving, uh, you know, a few kilometer resolution, I think that's the kind of target uh, for long timescale climate runs with Omega. Do you have any other question, either on this talk or in, on the previous talks? So for uh, previous talks for the screen, um, uh, the forecast, how do you initialize those? There's a couple of uh, different kind of equivalent approaches. Um, uh, so we've been using a uh, beta cast, but you could also use cat and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, and Walter Hanna has another one as well called Hiccup. Uh, this is for previous talks as well. Actually, it's for Peter and Michelle Chen. Uh, the V3 atmosphere model team and the Scream team have largely worked independently so far. And so in, as far as V4 is concerned, there's going to be uh, one model. So have, do you have any plan on how to collaborate between the groups like uh, within a, a liaison? I can see something that Peter can, you know, add. Uh, so um, one thing actually we collaborate uh, 
we have uh, the same deputy group leader, Susanna. Uh, she is playing the role, actually, try to uh, make the activity in different groups coordinated. Uh, another uh, thing, actually, if you look carefully about the phase two, phase three, the group structure, uh, we are in a big atmosphere group. We just have, you know, two different emphases. I think, you know, after we three phase, we are starting to merging, you know, to work together on some, you know, common uh, areas, specifically for the low-rise model development for V V four. Yeah, I would, I would say, Xiao Cheng and I work down the hall from each other. We chat all the time. Uh, uh, we're still trying to kind of sort out how exactly this is going to work. Um, I think one thing is that uh, the this. The Scream and Emacs X team tends to be more kind of uh, 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 software engineer is not the right term, but we're really, really focused on building a model. I think the V3 are focused on evaluating. So I'm hoping that uh, they're, and, and Xiao Cheng and I have talked about um, some of the V3 people helping with evaluate the, the Scream model. Um, and then I think, yeah, that we need to kind of sort out uh, how the low res is going to work in terms of collaborating between our teams. I have a question for Peter. So you mentioned uh, that you will use nudging for some applications. Um, so I might have two questions. First uh, is the nudging version for C++. Uh, ready for use. Second question is, uh, what's your plan for actually ap apply nudging uh, for the three kilometer? Because we have the highest uh, reanalysis data we have, maybe ER5, that's 12 kilometer. But nudging the three kilometer wind, uh, there will be a resolution difference. And usually it's better to use spectral nudging to only nudge the right scale so what's your plan on that? Yeah, so in, in terms of the ability to do nudging in C++, uh, uh, it exists in the model right now, but uh, Aaron Donahue is currently cleaning it up. So I'd say that there's kind of a first draft that's available now. Um, that first draft doesn't uh, allow you to do regional nudging, which is really important for RM. Um, and so that's uh, that's a work in progress, um, but we're having a hard time prioritizing it with all of our other stuff. So, um, you know, I'm not quite sure when it'll get done, hopefully in the next few months, but not sure. Um, in terms of uh, what to do when your model resolution is finer than uh, the reanalysis that you're nudging to, um, that's a good point, and we haven't really, we don't have any clever approaches for it. We've just been nudging to the, the coarser grid so far. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> the second half of the session is about tools, starting with a presentation by Rob Jacob. Uh, so, so this is kind of aimed at um, uh, people who are maybe new to the project or uh, have joined recently and aren't familiar with all of the tools that the infrastructure group, uh, along with others, have been developing to help to help with both running and analyzing the model. Uh, okay, so we're uh, if you think of the phases of model development. From start with configuring the model, how are you gonna how are you gonna actually what simulation are you gonna do? Building the code, submitting and running it to some system, and then uh, archiving the results on disk somewhere. And then from that short term archive, uh, you might pursue a long term archive on tape, uh, do some analysis, and and maybe publish the data for people to download. And we've been developing tools for um, for all of these. Uh, um, phases of analyzing the model, and some of them are listed here. We're going to go into some more details. Uh, this first one 
which uh, covers uh, most of this part of developing a model, is the scene case control system. Uh, this is the uh, workflow control code for creating an experiment in a seam enabled model like E3SM and CESM also uses this exact same system. It's written in Python with XML files for configuration and it allows you to configure, build, and run in a handful of cans on these very complicated uh, clusters and leadership computing facilities that we use. Uh, the most basic command is create new case, which will uh, set up the basic case that you're running. They then have, and then there's scripts to set up, build, and, and submit the job. And uh, these are all typically all made part of a, of a script, and the run E3SM script is the canonical example of that. But you can also run them by hand. So the run E3SM script is the, um, uh, in, in the normal case control system development workflow, you create an out-of-the-box case, and then you might customize it a little bit for your science. And everything you need is supposed to be in what's called the case directory. Um, but the problem with that case directory is it has hardwired in it things like the machine name and the user, and so that case directory itself is not very portable uh, to, uh, to either yourself on another machine or to a colleague on the same machine. So the running 3 sm script, which is written in Bash, solves a lot of this um, because all the commands to set up and run the model are in the script, and there's very simple and obvious lines to change the username or the machine name, and you can then hand that script off to somebody else or just move it to another machine yourself and a rerun almost exact, exactly the same case. It'll do everything from uh, um, checking out the code to uh, running all the case control system commands. And, um, uh, and then if you commit the script to an archive, you can then assure that people down the line will be able to run it as well. So um, once, as I mentioned, once the, um, once you have your results uh, 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 finished and you want to archive them to tape, uh, we have a tool called ZStash, uh, which everyone doing production simulations should use. And it uh, generates tar files of all of your output, all of the NetCDF files, and um, checksums to verify that those tar files are correct. And we'll also even do automated Globus transfer to move the archive files to another location if you generate them on one machine. And uh, the idea is to, is to take your um, uh, simulation data and archive it to tape in a logical and, and uh, queryable way. And this was first used in V1 production runs, and it's been used ever since. So uh, the NetCDF climate operators have a long history. It predates E3SM, but uh, we've been uh, supporting them since the project started. Uh, there are a dozen standalone command line programs that take in NetCDF files let you manipulate them and output net CDF files. Um, and uh, the, some of the big ones we use are NC Climo, which take the monthly time series and daily time series and make averages, and NC Remap, which does interpolations from uh, one grid to another. And uh, there's lots of useful tools in this suite. So our E3SM Diags is a, a Python package for uh, doing analysis of, the, of mostly the atmosphere output. Uh, comparing it with observations and comparing it also with uh, other runs. And it's, uh, it's uh, written entirely from scratch in Python, and it uh, allows you to flexibly add uh, new observations and, and variables. Um, it's uh, pretty easy to install. It uses multiprocessing to uh, speed up the analysis, and um, it uh, also uh, contains a good provenance of how this figure is generated for each figure. Um, and we're, uh, we are making an effort to use the latest DOE data for all these figures. Uh, MPAS analysis is a very similar concept, but it's for the MPAS models, especially the ocean and the sea ice. Um, it's, a, again, a, a modern Python program that will take the output from the model, the monthly histories and other time series, and generate climatologies and plots. Um, it does over 50 types of analyses and growing over 1,000 plots. Uh, like like EFRS on Diags, the output is a is a web page uh, with uh, galleries of plots, and it's also very highly configurable. So um, there's still a lot of steps here to uh, do the whole uh, do a whole science run, from configuring the model and and uh, doing all the analyses, and uh, um, and so uh, we've we've also been developing a workflow system uh, called SIPI, 
uh, which will uh, do allow you to specify all of these things to be done at once. And so it, it, won't, it will not just generate the climatologies, it will run EFRSM diags and MPAS analysis and other packages like ILAM uh, developed uh, uh, under other programs. And um, it will uh, cut, produce global mean time series and overview plots. Uh, it supports plugins so that you can add more um, analyses uh, packages to the workflow. And uh, there's a poster on this, which you can look at later today. Uh, there's a single configuration file that you uh, edit to uh, control what you want to do. And it's able to use uh, parallelism to execute lots of jobs in the batch system so that you uh, get done fairly quickly. So um, finally, we are also um, working on uh, XCDAT. Uh, this is an X-Array um, extended with the climate data analysis tools. Uh, our our ethosm diags packages has a dependency on CDAT, which is very old, no longer developed um, climate analysis software. And so we are uh, working along with the SEATS project to, uh, to uh, translate CDAT into modern Python with X-Array, and then we will replace um, the, the CDAT usage of D3SM diags with this XCDAT package. Uh, finally, so this is a lot of packages, right? How well, we've also been developing a Conda package called E3SM Unified. Uh, Conda is a Python packaging system, and um, this uh, puts all of these packages along with versions of Python and uh, NCO and CDAT and XCDAT, uh, IPython, um, and another, and, and just uh, over 300 dependencies, really, into this one Python package that we install for you on the supported machines. But it also, if you're familiar with Conda, and it's a pretty easy system to learn, uh, lets you install it on other clusters as well. And uh, we're also going to add to the next version uh, NCVIS, which was uh, also developed under the SEATS project. And that's a replacement for NCView, some of you remember, but it can do unstructured grids. So you don't have to interpolate something to a regular grid to get a quick visualization of your index CDF output. And this is not something that users typically but uh, basically this is the uh, tools that we use to uh, go from the archive data to something that is published on ESGF. Um, E3SM to CMIP is the biggest part of this because you have to, for CMIP publication, you have to convert things from our native output to the very particular requirements of uh, CMIP. And we also developed a, a data state machine to keep track of all the through this process. And right now that data state machine only works at Livermore, but we're working to make it more portable so we can do this workflow on other, other platforms. And then finally, um, there is the uh, PACE uh, uh, what you may not know is every time a new case or a run script, um, the, of course, performance statistics are output, and those performance statistics are copied from your case directory to another location on the machine, and then another set of software collects those and puts it in the database, and this, uh, and this website will browse that database. So every run you've ever done in the project on one of our accounts is probably in this database somewhere. And you can search by your username and uh, performance analysis, uh, performance statistics, the timings, et cetera, from that run. And there's also some provenance data collected and displayed here as well, like every name list, every XML file. And uh, we have not yet mined the potential here, uh, but it's um, got, uh, has a lot of it. Okay. Do we have any question, Peter? So what pieces of this uh, uh, system do you think are gonna break down with global three kilometer data? Hmm. Probably probably the diagnostics uh, is, is probably the, the most likely. Um, uh, and I'm not sure it'll break, but it'll become very slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Rob, how's the documentation for doing all the installation of the condo package and, and then doing the, the runs? Is there all in one place? Um, e each of those packages does have a, a documentation page. I don't know if there's a super document uh, that points you to everything, but uh, um, uh, but yes, all of them do have documentation. Super document. Yeah, super document would be good. <laughs> I noticed in one of the slides you had Dask. How serious are you about exploiting all the capabilities of Dask? That would address all of Peter's concerns. Yeah, um, uh, we, we definitely want to take advantage of it. That's one of the reasons for moving to X-Array uh, as the base for a lot, of our, a lot of our tooling. But it's, again, something that just needs some time to, to explore. Okay, if no more question, let's move to the last talk of the session. Walter Hanna on the RM and grids. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about regional mesh refinement. Um, and uh, I'm only gonna talk about the land and atmosphere. I was gonna talk about the ocean, but I had to cut those slides just uh, for time. Um, but if you don't know what it is, I have a simple example here with this eyeball looking grid. And you can see I've enhanced the grid spacing on this big patch on the equator. What? <laughs> yeah, that was the idea. Um, but so the idea of, of regional mesh refinement is to put resolution where it's needed. And you might, a lot of people say, the first thing they think is like, well, just refine everywhere, right? But the idea is to do things efficiently. If you want to do a local impact assessment at a very fine scale, but you don't want to break the bank, that's what this tool is really here for. But it's underutilized, and I think there's two main reasons for that. The first one is that the setup is pretty tedious. It's straightforward, but you can get kind of hung up on certain parts of it. And the other one is this big, long-standing question about scalar physics. I have a lot of thoughts about that. If somebody wants to ask about that in the q and it would be fun to talk about. But I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, and so the point of this talk is to really just go through the whole setup procedure, give, make sure everyone knows how straightforward it is, and maybe encourage more people to use it. Uh, and I think another point here is that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit to figure out how to best use this tool. And I put one idea up here. On the top there, I have the typical any 30 grid. And on the bottom, I have a case where I've taken uh, the ocean regions and made them any 20, and the land I've made any 40. But the total number of grid cells is about the same. So you'd have to adjust the time step in the atmospheric dynamics. But basically, if, if this were to give you some sort of improvement in your climate, it would basically be for free. Um, so uh, let's, I'm just going to walk through the process of how you make a new grid and how that process is modified if you want to do refinement. So there's basically five steps of things you have to create. Um, and in red are the ones that are slightly changed when you want to refine the grid. So first you have to create the grid. Obviously that has to be different for refinement. But then you need inputs for the component coupler, inputs for the land model, inputs for the atmosphere model, and then finally some code changes to support that new grid. Um, yeah, and I made this example centered on Denver just for fun. Um, so yeah, when you go on to create a new grid, it's very simple. I, um, it's just a si series of three commands that I put there. Um, those are the ones you'd use to create the any 30 grid. And if you want to create a refined version of that, you just have to replace that first command with this squad gen tool that was developed by Paul Ulrich. Um, and the important input there is you need a black and white image file to specify your refinement region. And the example I have there is the one I used for that Denver-centered map that I just created with a very simple Python script. So I made sure that the, you know, the, the little circle there was centered on the right latitude and longitude. So it's a pretty simple process there. Um, so then you get into creating the inputs. And for the component coupler, the main thing is you need mapping files which for a typical bi-grid case where the atmosphere and land share a grid, you only need six mapping files, which is a simple series of NC remap commands. And then you need domain files, which are used at runtime. And they're created with this gen domain tool that we inherited from CESM, which is a Fortran tool. Um, but it's pretty simple. It only requires a single mapping file. Uh, then when you get to the land model, this is where things kind of get a little tricky 
because um, you have to create this land surface data set, FSRDAP. Uh, there's two tools you have to build and run, uh, make map data, make surf data, and they'll download a bunch of data files, make a bunch of mapping files, apply the mapping files, but it's a lot of data. And so sometimes you need a batch job on a large memory node to make this really work. Um, and then the other thing you need is a land initial condition. And there's two viable options for this. You either regrid an existing one or you do a cold start spin up where all the soil water is set to a minimum. And that takes several decades uh, to get going. So on the atmosphere side, you have to generate a, top uh, a new topography file. And there's tools for that that are included in the repo. Um, you also need an atmospheric initial condition. And there's this hiccup tool that I created mainly for doing hindcast simulations using era 5 data, um, but remapping initial conditions from other grids usually works too. Um, the nice thing about Hiccup is that it includes these special adjustment routines around topography to kind of uh, avoid instability right at the beginning. There's also this aerosol dry deposition file, and uh, so MAM has to calculate these surface deposition rates, and to do that it needs information about the land surface. And so for whatever reason, I don't understand why we have this file really, but I had this conversation with Chi the other day, and it sounds like we don't actually need this. There's, we could remove this dependency by getting that information from the land model. And then finally, there's um, code changes that need to happen. And there's three files that must be changed every time you add a new grid to kind of just define the grid and change some name list values. Um, and then there's some other files that might need to be changed in special circumstances if you're doing a coupled case or you want to add a regression test. So, um, so then the last thing I want to talk about is just the, the pain points. The workflow tools, um, I feel all of us that have done this have run into this problem where you go to do this and everything's broken. And you have to go through the notes and update the documentation like, oh, add this flag here. And it's just a pain. I don't really know how to fix it. Testing could definitely help. Um, rewriting the tools to be more streamlined could help. Um, it's unclear. The other big problem is this land input data. And again, I don't really know how to fix this. Maybe we could make some intermediate files that are lower resolution, take the biggest files and break them up into separate files for each field. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I didn't have time to talk about the ocean grid generation. In some ways, it's much more complicated, but in other ways, it's much more streamlined because of the Compass uh, Polaris tool chain. Um, but then anytime you have to deal with that, you have to deal with ocean spin up, which is another big expensive problem to solve. Um, and machine learning could help there, I think. So uh, with that, I put some links to some resources if anybody wants to look at the tutorials or the tools. And um, yeah, I'll take any questions. Um, not, not a question, but just a quick comment about the dry deposition for aerosol. aerosol the aerosol life cycle is highly sensitive to dry deposition and uh, particularly for larger aerosol particles. Um, coupling those would coupling that with the land model is something that uh, certainly from a science perspective could be done and might be quite interesting, but it's something we need to be very cautious about introducing uh, additional couplings that will further add further complexity into the model um, and make it, 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 like the, this would need to be very carefully tested and also it will add complexities to every tuning process after that. So we that I just want to caution this is not probably as simple as 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 you're thinking no, it no, might no. be I, right I, now. I, I I totally agree. I totally agree. I I thought it was interesting because when I started looking into it, I don't know the historical reason why it exists. Um, you know, maybe well, I it, I, I think it exists because in order to calculate dry deposition, you need information about the land surface, and it's safer to have that be prescribed and not coupled from a from a system engineering point of view. I was thinking it was for configurations where maybe the land was where, where the land is not having the bed, like the old CSM. Yeah, and, and this That's is probably the also the case, but we we often find that when we introduce new couplings into um, you know the coupled atmospheric chemistry aerosol biogeochemistry system that it introduces that that things do not behave the way we originally anticipated, and because of this historically we often have used 
a lot of, as you know, for example, we, we're still using the dry deposition of dust as prescribed files that were developed years ago by Natalie Mahowald because those files were produced very carefully with very careful, very well validated simulations and, and we know that they work. It doesn't mean we shouldn't ever couple that in the future, but, but we just need to be aware that as soon as we couple this, then for example, the ocean biogeochemistry will become sensitive to changes in the dry depth. And we need to be really conscious of the amount of complexity that we're buying, not just at that moment, but for every effort moving forward. Yeah, right. thanks. So it's very nice to see, uh, so we have streamlined the procedures in creating those kind of RM grids. Uh, but I believe we still need to spend a lot of effort in validating the new grids you generated. Uh, so do you have any guidance for people uh, what's the normal way to generate? Do we have to run the high rise globally in order to compare you know, the high rise resolution within the area of interest you're yeah. generating. So I think one of my main points is that we need to figure that out. And to figure that out, we have to do a bunch of grid, we have to create a bunch of grids and run with them, right? Like, I think a bunch of us have done these own experiments, um, maybe not even as part of an official, official part of a project, you know, not part of a proposed work, but just something to test an idea. I've had dozens of these experiments and it kind of, you know, you just kind of wander around in the dark because there are no guidelines, right? Um, so, so, yeah, I think we need to do a lot of testing to figure that out. I, I don't think there's any recipe that exists, really. Um, yeah, it's very situation dependent, too, because if you, like that example I gave where you had any 20, any 40, I think it'd be pretty easy to get that going. Um, and you could use a cheese uh, technique where you keep the physics time step the same so that you don't, the tuning won't be that sensitive, right? Oh, you just have to make sure that the dynamics are stable. Um, and I think that would be a very easy case. But then we talk about like Peter Bogenschutz, California RRM, where you're, it relies on regional nudging to really be useful. You know, that's a whole different animal. So if that, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I had a question, quick question. What fraction of the tools are in ECSM unified? Uh, the, uh, Can you generate the grid just using ECSM unified tools or you no, need to? None of them are in the you know, None of them. They all <laughs> exist in the repo. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I guess NC Remap exists. But the tools you presented at the beginning, they are not in, in ECSM unified. Yeah, I mean, home tool required, you're building parts of home, right? No, 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 uh, on the first slide. You had just for grid generation. Is that even in ECSM unified? Oh, um, Squadgen and the other one. I think I don't think Squadgen is, but I think um, Tempest Remap is. The, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. ECSM unified is for post processing. This is pre processing. <laughs> <laughs> it's unified. <laughs> So this is this happens a lot in these meetings. People put up a bunch of stuff and they go, "That's cool," and they want links. I mean, this is what what question Chris is really getting at. He'd like them all in one place in the same package, but you know, people will look at this and they go, "I want to do that," or at least I want to play with it. And they look up your presentation, and they go, "I can't find these," and then they give up. Yeah, I mean, but uh, the links. So where do you go? Where do you go to look for every one of those links you put up? Right. Okay. So the the running E3SM on new atmospheric grids encapsulates all of this, and that's all on Confluence. It, that's a link to a Confluence. Yeah, I know that. Very one. easy to find, right? If you just put in atmosphere grid, it's like the first thing that comes up in this. Right. But but my point is, if people download your slides, will those links be active? Yeah, it's just a PDF. But I guess they converted it to a PowerPoint. I don't know if it would preserve there, but the PDF links work. Right. Because you don't want you don't want your Slack channel to light up. Oh, I don't mind. People can Slack me. I don't care. <laughs> this is one case where E3SM has done a very good job on documentation because that page, especially Ben Hillman, many contributors. Yeah, it's it's megabytes and very complete. It could be more complete. It's quite detailed though right now. I mean, come. The first link. Yeah, the main tutorial there. Um, it goes through all. It goes through. You know. Well, I just it, could be, it could be improved. We I, have written some good documentation. Yeah. And 
Can we have a show of hand who has ever generated a grid? Yeah. Half a dozen, a dozen. Okay. Just want to add that there are many RGMA APIs. I just want to add that there are many RGM APIs who've really benefited from this. So, so they're going to give us money. We share money. We are all one program. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to mention we did uh, take some steps at the end of phase two to um, put the, some of these tools under test. Uh, make atmosphere surf file, make surf that gen, gen domain are tested in a Jenkins at, at Argon. Oh, okay. That, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I have this discussion, or maybe I should call it an argument with Ben all the time, where I, uh, I think some of these would, we'd benefit from rewriting them and in some consistent way, and we could, we could put them through unit tests, we could do all this fancy stuff, and his argument is always like, why they work, don't, don't fix what's not broken, like, <laughs> and, you know, he's got a really good point, but at the same time, uh, you need robust testing to make these things usable. Um, so, I don't know. Right. My job is to priority search. Walter. I think I think generating the grid is relative. It's the easier part here. Yeah, um, making it uh, scientifically valid is the significantly more difficult part. Yeah, can we make that easier? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I mean, this kind of gets at the scale aware question, right? Uh, and I, um, um, I, I, I think that the um, personally, I think the MMF could help us talk about that. I think the other problem there is that we don't know, because scale awareness and scale sensitivity is such an ill-defined concept, like there's no way uh, to measure how scale aware something is. Like you can make something and say it's scale aware and nobody can prove you wrong, right? So I think a really important science question is to figure out what it means to be scale aware and how to quantify it. Can we maybe make more templates, for example, for the land component? If we make more templates that are stable, that are robust, would that help? Because well, the, the purpose of that tutorial uh, by Ben was written because he was having difficulty with the land component being inaccurate. And that's what I'm facing personally, too. Yeah, you're talking about in the spin-up process. Partly, right? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to address that, really. Uh, Okay, one last question, and then we'll go for the break. Yeah, it's actually a comment that I think that um, in terms of scientific validation of RM grids and, and best practices for making something that actually like provides good science, I thought that you had a good answer already in your talk about uh, that we really need to actually do these experiments. Like, this would be a great thing for someone to write a paper about in terms of like, hey, when you want to make a uh, our M grid off the west coast of some continent, you probably need to go upstream some bit and, you know. Yeah, like, guidelines, guidelines develop through. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great to have like a paper that gives us guidelines for E3SM RM. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all the speakers and the audience. Uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. I was frantically writing slides through that last talk. Um, so, uh, how do I advance? There we go. Uh, so, uh, this is a talk about uh, development best practices and also a little bit about running best practices uh, in E3SM. And um, what informs this talk is documents, some documents we've developed since the very start of the project such as the development gaining started guide. That was originally the development quick start guide, but when it got to 25 detailed steps, it didn't seem <laughs> right to call it the quick start. And then the new feature request process, uh, which we worked on last year. Um, and my own experience, and this example will kind of assume development 
of a new science feature. So uh, the first, uh, first thing you want to do is plan your development. And we have some new procedures for that in, our, in this uh, feature request process. Uh, you first need to create what's called a new feature overview document, uh, which is a description, words, or a diagram, or both, of what code changes are needed, which models, what, or what subcomponents within the models, uh, what infrastructure are you going to change, and a statement about how the model will be improved and how that improvement will be demonstrated. Like, I'm going to reduce the split ITCZ, and I'm going to show that by a 50-year coupled run. Um, and then a description of some of the anticipated documentation changes. Uh, we don't get to have documentation set up for all the models, but we're thinking ahead here. Uh, we'll add a section describing the parameterization, something very simple like that. The exact format of this document and where it's going to be published is till TBD. Um, and then a uh, started development. And this is also kind of new in the project since before we started. We're asking you to create a fork, assuming your new feature development was approved. Assuming uh, if you're an E3SM staff member, it's in the roadmap, but this is the quarter to start it. Um, so uh, if you're first time doing development, you're going to make a fork for the first time, and you go to the main E3SM project slash E3SM page, and there's this fork button. And um, that will create uh, your very own copy of the E3SM repo. It's, it's just a Git clone done within GitHub. And, um, it's a repo that you own, so you have a right permission to it. Um, with all of the features typical of a GitHub repo, you could make PRs to that. You could start issues. There's a wiki. Um, it's everything that we have in our E3SM project slash E3SM. Um, and then something that we did not have in the project when we started, uh, because it, GitHub didn't have it, there's this little sync button which will let you uh, sync this fork with the upstream version. And uh, and you just push that button and it happens. And uh, we didn't we didn't push forks early on in the project, partly because Git was new, but also because it didn't have this GitHub didn't have this. You had to <laughs> yeah, we'd have to do some complicated manual process to, to update your fork. And what that will do, what syncing will do is, that first of all, any any changes to master that were done in the upstream, it will bring those to your fork. And I think it would also bring in any tags. Um, and that's good because you're going to start development from this fork and you always want to develop from the latest version of master. So you also want to make sure not to merge to your forks master. You could because it's your repo, you have write permission and everything, but uh, just uh, you could put protections on it, do something to um, uh, not, want to not merge yourself to the master because you always want that to be an exact copy of the upstream. So you're only ever going to change that by doing that sync operation. And then you can invite collaborators to work with you on your fork. As you know, if you want right permission to E3SM projects, you got to write to me or to Wade or to somebody and we add you. But on your fork, you're in control. You have a settings button and you can click the little add people button and you can add your collaborators with their GitHub address and they can, and you can give them right permission and they can push to your, they can push their own branches and they can push commits to your branches. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so now you have your fork, you're set up, set up and you're ready to start development. So you have a machine that you're comfortable working on. Maybe it's your laptop, maybe it's a cluster you have really good internet access to. Um, uh, so you're gonna do a Git clone from your fork uh, on GitHub to your local machine. And then you're gonna make a feature branch with our branch name convention, conventions, which have been in place for a while. And you start off with your, uh, your branch name has three parts, your GitHub username, um, so that we know who's working on this branch, uh, the area of E3SM you're working in, like EAM or Helm or something like that, and then a short description of the feature. And here's a nice example from uh, Bryce. It's got his username, what he's working on, and a description. And note, the description does the right thing. It's verb noun construction. So you always want to start with a verb, like add, remove, fix, change, and then uh, a description of what you're doing. Uh, a, a bit aside on GitHub user pages. So when you get a GitHub account, you get a GitHub user page, you need to treat this as part of your professional online presence. So if you don't already, fill out your name. You go to your page and there's a little edit profile button 
And right there, there's a box to put your name in. Put the name you use in publications. And it doesn't have to be a picture of yourself if you're shy, but uh, something besides the default avatar uh, would be recommended. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, before you make changes, we ask you to create a baseline, which is a, some run of the model uh, with some history or some other output that uh, you can use to tell if you've done something you didn't mean to. So uh, we ask people to use the create test system. And if you've never used it before, it's pretty easy. Um, the, the, the command is inside the E3SM SIEM scripts directory. And what you do is um, you do create test. The uh, minus G command means to generate a baseline. The standard test suite we ask everyone to run is E3SM developer, uh, which, which runs several cases, maybe not cases you're working on, but um, it definitely is one case for a comp set you're working on. And, uh, but it's a good protection against maybe changing something that you didn't mean to. And then the baseline name and the baseline root are so you can find these things uh, because you're going to need to refer to them later. Uh, if you don't give it a baseline name, it'll just give it some string of numbers uh, attached to every uh, test case name. And uh, the baseline root will normally be a shared directory, um, but uh, you probably want it to be in some place that you control. Um, and then every time you're going to make a large set of changes, you can run the same command, but instead of minus G, you have minus C, which means compare. So what that'll do is it'll run the same test suite. So it'll run some basic tests, like a, a smoke test or a restart test on all these cases. But then it'll also compare, do a bit-for-bit -bit comparison of whatever the output is with that baseline you generated earlier. And uh, so if you make a commit that purposely changes the answers, which you might do, you need to want to regenerate that baseline. Um, and this will allow you to, uh, uh, it, just, it just keeps your branch nice and healthy while you're developing uh, so that we don't have to find all the problems when we start testing it nightly. So um, you make changes by adding commits to your branch. So ideally, and this is kind of where the art of programming comes in, each commit has to be a logical, reviewable unit of code changes. What exactly is that unit? Uh, that's going to be up to you to decide. Uh, maybe your change is so simple, it just takes one commit. But if you're doing a big, a big development project, it's probably going to take a few. And um, what, what you do is stage each file changed which, with git add file name. And then when you're ready to make the commit, you type git commit. Please don't use git commit minus A. This is lazy. Git commit minus A will automatically commit everything you've changed, and that's how junk gets into your branch. Like, oh, I didn't mean to update that module. I didn't mean to have that run script here. That's because you did git commit minus A. Um, and also, make a good commit message. So a commit message should be a one-line explanation of the commit. Um, don't wrap this, don't make this be 500 characters long that wraps into the body. Uh, make it fit on one line, add a space, and then add some more detail about what the commit is. If you honestly can't think of anything else to add, just repeat the line. Um, <clears throat> it should be a reasonable length. You're not writing an article. Uh, the commit messages are meant for other people to read, possibly months or years later. So you should describe a little bit about why you're changing this and what you're trying to do. And then make sure this is just text, no URLs because this is going to be a go, go into the Git log, and the Git log lasts forever. Long after all, all of us have left this project, the Git log, the log message of that commit will still be around. But any URLs could go stale. So a URLs is fine, but don't put them in the main body. Put them down here. Um, you're not ready to push your branch to GitHub with a Git push origin my branch name. And we'd like you to do that as soon as you have one commit. Don't wait until you're done. This is really essential to our open development philosophy. Um, we're not doing the development somewhere private and then only pushing released versions to GitHub. Have you ever heard about a source code? Oh, this is available on GitHub. And you go look at it and it has one commit for all the source code. That's because they actually did the development somewhere else and then pushed the final product with one commit to, uh, to GitHub. That's not open development. It's open source, but it's not open development. Um, if you're adding a test, if you're adding a feature that needs a nameless flag to turn it on, uh, you're also going to want to test to do that. 
Um, and then your PR is going to have to pass, um, or your branch is going to have to pass uh, the super bit for bit test that we're calling uh, conservation and performance test that we are still defining. Those, those don't all exist yet. Yeah, testing is very important. It's one of the things we emphasized from the start of this project, uh, thanks to people like Andy um, uh, really pushing us on that. Um, never, a real obvious one is never commit anything that doesn't build. So you always want to rerun the build before you commit something. Um, uh, in an advanced case, you might have a second copy of your branch in another case with a different compiler, and you can test the build there and catch like it's always something that, oh, GNU caught this, but Intel didn't. You can find those yourself early. Um, and then, oh, I already put that in there. I meant to move that. Um, okay. And when you're finished development, you're going to make a, a pull request. So a pull request from a fork will automatically expect you to be pointing back to the master upstream, uh, which is a pain if you actually want to make a PR to your fork. Um, but uh, it, the intention is that everything makes it back to the upstream master. And the message in the PR is standards are very similar to the commit message. And that's because that's going to become a commit message when this PR is merged. It'll be in the merge commit. Um, so you have a one line explanation of the commit. Uh, GitHub puts the branch name here, but just erase that and put in a one line message. Uh, and then there's a more detailed explanation, just like uh, but th this is now a summary of the whole branch, not just the the, the one commit. Uh, if your branch has multiple commits, this is a summary of what's happening in the branch. And maybe it fixes a bug or some other issue. And then uh, below a line, you can add all of the non-text things that you want to do to explain this message. Because again, we're just going to copy and paste this into the merge commit message when it gets merged to master. And then, um, uh, so... GitHub lets you assign reviewers, um, uh, so you should you should know who needs to review this. Uh, at least it might be if you don't really know, then you assign your group lead, and they'll assign somebody else. Um, and then you also want to designate uh, in GitHub. This is called an assignee, and that's the space we use for the integrator. Um, there is a list which uh, which we will point you to of what the integrators are for each component. Uh, you can pick one. And uh, if they're busy, they can assign another one. And then uh, pay attention because you're not done when you issue the PR and fill all this out. You're done when the PR is closed and is merged to master. And stuff may come up during testing. There might be review comments. And if it's waiting on you to take action, then this is getting old and stale and um, not making it to master. Ideally, one, once a pull request is made, it should be merged pretty quickly because you've done all the testing. Uh, you've finished the feature, and um, you've uh, followed good programming practices, and it, it, it should not take a lot of time. But it does because the integrators are busy and we're busy, but ideally it could be merged quickly. So um, uh, switching now to uh, some best practices for running E3SM, and uh, this is based on experience from the uh, Phase 2 water cycle campaign, and it's kind of a... Uh, an outline of, of what they do. Um, so you want to start by configuring a, a model run run script. This is particularly important for production runs. Um, so you're, you're ideally you're customizing the run script by just changing a few parameters. Uh, the case name should have some metadata about the run, but not too long. Uh, that's something you may want to work with the group lead on. Um, also, we encourage you to use the group name. This is something new we added to Seam in a like a year or so ago, and it's basically just another piece of metadata that you could put on multiple cases so you can signify to some later provenance tool like PACE that these cases are related, and we can use that when we're displaying them. Uh, so if you, have a, if you have a giant list of runs to do for your simulation campaign, you may want to give some thought about what are the case names going to be, how are they going to be grouped, what should the group name be, because we will use all that in displaying results later. And it's hard to change after the fact. Big <laughs> uh, uh, chain, all of your changes to do the run are within the script. You shouldn't have to edit anything else. You can put said commands to do edits to files, and there's examples of how to do that. Um, 
scripts, because the idea is that the script is the recipe, the exact recipe to reproduce the run. And it can be added to a Git repo and kept forever. Uh, it's recommended to run a few short tests before you start a long production simulation. Uh, like I said, our, our, our regular testing should catch any problems. If you're doing a run off of master, there shouldn't be any issues here. Um, like a lesson to restart test for case of interest. And then um, when you're done with the run, uh, uh, even a single submission, you want to do the short-term archiving. This avoids having the run directory fill up with hundreds and thousands of files. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'm almost done. Um, uh, you do, ideally, we do this after each successful submission, and Seam will do it for you automatically if you set the right flag. Uh, and, then, and then you can also uh, clean up the render after you archive by just removing everything because you don't need anything in the render once everything's been archived and the next submission knows how to regenerate anything needed. Um, if your job crashes, this is important, um, we recommend that you resubmit from the point you were going to start that run at. Um, and, but it's important to clean up that render before you restart. Because if you don't, the, the, and the next run is successful, the short-term archive will take the successful stuff and the unsuccessful stuff and put it all into the short-term archive because it just copies log files and then CDF files. It doesn't know any better. And then that stuff gets into the Z stash, then it gets to the post-processing, and it can create problems. So if your run crashes, it's very important that you clean up your render, just RM everything in there because the case submit command will pick up where you left off. Uh, if you want to, if you want to start from the most recently written restart set, that's a bit harder. Uh, you should clean up everything except that restart set <laughs> and, and the history written before it. And, um, uh, and uh, you have to uh, uh, tell Seam what date to start from. And then finally, uh, documenting the model run. Uh, this is so we ask definitely in the ETHSM project for, for uh, simulation campaigns. Uh, every model run or ensemble should be documented on Confluence on, on a separate page. Uh, each job associated with the run, because it takes several submissions to get a run done, should be listed along with the corresponding pace links and the number of nodes, which will have the number of nodes in the simulated years per day. You can also put in links to the, uh, to the ETHSM diags and impasse analysis plots that were generated from that run. And we are hoping to automate this process so that you don't have to constantly go back and edit uh, Confluence pages. And I believe that's all I had. Nope, one more. Um, so this is all summarized in a, in a page on our public documentation space. Uh, it's a living, the, the run steps. It's a living document. Uh, we are willing to change it uh, uh, as we uh, change our process. Uh, but it has everything written down in detail, including doing analysis steps, which I'm not really getting into. Okay, uh, any questions? So just because of time, while we change speakers, maybe we can do one question, but otherwise we, uh, we don't have time for any questions. But so if we, if, Rob, if you wanna have one person, if there's a short question, yeah, so we can just- That's an easy one. Um, we've been using branches. Are we supposed to start using forks now? Um, well, uh, they're, they're, the, a branch is for development, um, and the fork is, a, is another clone of the repo. So you would still use branches, but the branch would be off your fork instead of off the main repo. I guess the, so the <laughs> question is, are we supposed to be developing branches off of our own fork rather yes. than, okay. Yeah. Ideally, there's that's, still a lot of- I know, that's, okay. there's like a thousand branches okay. on our ETHSM, right? Should, we want to- We want to- Make sure everybody <laughs> hears that message. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, and else, other questions, we'll find Rob during the break, please. I, I would just like to say, don't remove everything from your run directory. Not everything gets archived. The, the nameless files, the nameless files, the stream files for impasse don't get archived. Well. <laughs> Okay, should I get started? <clears throat> so I'm Chris Troy and coming from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And I'm 
here representing the atmospheric integration team um, talking about our experiences trying to follow the code review process in our v3 atmosphere integration and so wanted to acknowledge the atmospheric integration team who've provided input for this talk the reviewers to the different prs that we submitted and also to the computational scientists who've actually helped to improve the code by fixing many of the issues that we had with our code and so when we started we were feeling like okay we're into new charted uncharted territories we're like astronauts reading a new um, manual but another way of looking at it was also we were also guinea pigs on our first experience is going through the code review process and hopefully this will help uh, inform future um, development and so oops there there we go and so um, Xiao Cheng already talked about the different uh, V3 integration process, uh, features that are going into the atmosphere. And so I won't go dwell on it, but there are 11 new features. And so there are 11 new features, all each one of them quite involved, lots of code, and each one had to go in as a separate PR. And so what we try to do is for each one of them, follow the code review process. And the code review process, we all agreed, provides more clarity and consistency when it comes to documentation, what type of tests we need to run. Um, but of course, there's more room for specificity when it comes to what do we actually need to run, and I'll try to touch on those later. It was also useful for uh, identifying problems early. For example, these bit for bit issues that were in, each, in some of the code that we were pushing. Of course, not. we still made mistakes, but it helped most of the mistakes before we actually started pushing things into master. The one thing we didn't appreciate, I think, when we were first developing the code is that we have a specific target of what we're hoping to fix, what we're hoping to increase capabilities for, but we also, this is, we're pushing to master, which is an Earth system model. We were just making changes to the atmosphere, but it can potentially have impacts on other parts of the code. And so, what these, especially the testing suites helped was to check compatibility when it came to making sure that when we pushed some new part of the code and it was turned on, it actually didn't break other parts of the code. And that's the code review process. And I think in essence, it's, it's good that we have it, had it, have it, but when it came to actually applying the process, a lot of questions came up. Uh, for example, What's a super bit for bit test? And I think that's still in the process of being actually made more concrete. Uh, master has changed. How do we change? Uh, do we need to rerun all of our tests again when it comes to running super uh, bit for bit tests, but also time it um, simulations? What's the ordering of the PRs to go in, especially if we have to rerun all these tests? Who, so who gets to go first? And especially for when it comes to doing component Within the component, a lot of, there's a lot of dependencies between the different features, and so ordering does matter. The tests were all passing on Chrysalis, and this was a personal experience, but why is it failing on Perlmutter CPU on the GNU compiler? Um, what's the difference between a non bit for bit and climate changing PR as well? And it's, uh, it takes a lot of time to run all of these tests, and that's the main lesson that we learned from this. It takes a lot of time uh, following the code review process. So. Uh, one of the lessons is start early. And I think uh, in the long term, what will help to will be to have a short tutorial on the code review process. I think the slides that Rob had just put up will be useful, but also a little bit more information about super bit for bit tests, as well as some of the other tests that will be part of the code review process. So next, what I'll be talking about are lessons learned. Um, start early. There's documentation, there's super bit for bit tests, component specific tests, coupled simulations, and the review, and maybe an iteration, especially if there's some changes that we need to make into the make in the code when that are found during the review process. Uh, what we found was uh, documenting all these steps is important so that we don't miss any of them. What we used was Confluence, but of course there might be other platforms that we can do this better on. The second uh, lesson was test frequently, test widely, and automate. This repeats what Rob brought up. Um, fixing uh, for the for us, the, the domain scientists, one of the biggest roadblocks was trying to fix seam test fails that were coming up. Um, especially, what's the difference between ERP and ERS test? If one, if ERS is um, it passes but ERP fails, what does that mean? And so. 
we were rerunning tests often uh, after each one of the commits and having some automated testing script really helped this process. So things that Wu Yin as well as Hui Wan have posted helped us with this process. And in the end, what was really important was to get help from the computational scientists when it came to some of these bit for bit issues that domain science, us domain scientists were struggling with. And therefore, for example, on Slack, we had a TGB3 bit for bit test uh, Slack channel that was really helpful to have that conversation, trying to track down what were the bit for bit tests that we needed to actually fix. And and it's to the same, uh, a similar vein of communicate, communicate, communicate. These testing, uh, these new features don't go in, don't shouldn't be happening in the silo. Um, it was important to communicate within the developers and the components to figure out what the ordering of the PR should be, so that especially if there were dependencies, were there linkages that needed to be made? When it came to bit for bit tests. It's important to get communicate with the testing experts and get information of what other tests should be we be running if we want to track them what's the issue with the code and then uh, we learned the hard way um, we needed to do a better job of communicating with the other component groups uh, when it comes to merging things into master especially there are things that were changing the climate that were affecting the development of other component groups and therefore in the past, uh, what we ended up doing was reverting some of these PRs that we first um, merged. And so um, all of this happens in the context of uh, there's always going to be exceptions and fringe cases that aren't covered by the code review process. And therefore, when it comes to trying to figure out what are the solutions, what, what are the next steps, if it's not caught by, these, um, by the code review, um, it's important that we actually communicate with a broad audio, a broad number of people so that we figure out a way forward that works for everyone. And the final lesson is um, perhaps make all features stealth, especially these large features that have an impact on climate. And this was a case where we're trying to get from one climate, uh, the current climate, to something hopefully better, a better climate. But how do you get from one to the other without disrupting other development that's going on? For example, on the far right, what we're looking at are AOD biases, and that the top one is V2, and then the bottom one is V3 atmosphere. And so we do improve on the AOD, but that has an impact on the top of the atmosphere radiation. What we would have done, um, I think, if we started off with the code review process, if we knew if the code review process was already set when we started development, was to make all of these stealth features and then turn them on when we wanted to um, turn everything on within the B3 atmosphere feature. And, but I leave this as a question mark since um, I know stealth features are actually also harder to test as well. And so that gets me to the summary. Um, four different lessons, uh, start early, test frequently, test widely, automate, communicate, and uh, consider making many of these large features stealth and then turning them on later. Um, but then uh, this was the first go as well, and so we made many mistakes along the way. But hopefully with the lessons learned, uh, we can also improve on the process. With that, thank you for your attention. Two minutes uh, for any questions. Hi, thanks, Chris, for giving such a wonderful overview and also just all your hard work on a very difficult task of leading this V3 integration effort to really um, work through a lot of difficult technical issues and uh, and just organizational organizationally holding everything together. is it, it was a huge effort. So thanks very much. Um, I, I did. I, I did have a kind of a couple of comments I wanted to add on. Um, just I, I came in late and have been just kind of an observer of the last six to eight ten months or so of this process um but I, I there are a couple of things that i've that i observed that i think are also worth adding to uh kind of your your lessons learned so the the other thoughts that, that i notice and kind of looking back at the i guess another point is i've been looking at the code review process a lot recently because we're in the process of working out how this is going to work for eagles so this is also kind of 
provoked me to think about it. Um, and there, there's some things that, that, um, the, that I think can be further clarified, uh, in particular related to the simulation tests. There's a, a requirement um, for features to do a comparison with a baseline maintained by each component group, but we never we never got around to establishing necessarily what exactly the baselines should be, and so um, so the V3 integration um, effort used Ethersem diags in the model versus ops comparison mode for all of the new features. As as far as I uh, have seen. There are they generally were not producing model versus model, so you, so the so we so it's uh, kind of difficult to disentangle what the impact of the new feature was. So that's a place for uh, that's something that could be improved. Um, and also there are areas where we don't yet have diagnostics in our standard tools, and so then we're not measuring what the impacts are uh, of new features on on those things that we haven't yet built into our standard tools. So I think this points to a need to continue investing effort into adding more of the the things that it's important for us to keep measuring into E3SM diagnostics or other standard tools that can be used during the PR process. And, and then the final point I wanted to mention is that one of the things I, that to me appears to have made this process particularly hard, and it'd be great to hear your thoughts on it also, was just because of the, the nature of the development during the last phase was such that Many new features, uh, feature developments were launched in parallel and all finished at the same time and needed to be merged simultaneously, but they all are coupled to each other and have interactions at which we didn't see uh, the effects of those interactions until all of them were turned on after all of the code review process was done. And, and this is um, kind of, there have been, there have been a, a, a things that have come up related to interactions between features where uh, maybe there are ways we can think in the future about planning out roadmaps for when new features are going to come in uh, kind of more deliberately in a way that minimizes or, or limits those issues a bit more. So those, are, those, are, those are my thoughts. Um, so I, I, I can stop now, but I, I, I'd love to hear your reactions as well. Yeah, with the last point, um, there were points in the past where we started coupling different components together, but at the same time, there were there was development fixing things as well along the way. So we did have, as you know, there was a parallel effort on a different fork where we did try to couple everything together. And so by the time we were doing running on master, we had a good idea of what the climate would we expect to look like once we started merging everything on master, but of course. If you can do it much earlier, it's much easier. But then I think we were running into the issue of we didn't know which features will be making its way into V3 atmosphere. There were performance considerations as well in terms of computational cost, and some things didn't make it in for that reason. So, yeah, I think um, in terms of, oh, yes, uh, when it comes to model versus model comparisons, I agree. Uh, I personally had to run baselines whenever I ran these, and then Whenever there was a non bit change, I still ran faster. And so having baselines already available for the new developers to just run, run just their feature branch turned on and then compare with model to model, make it easy, easier to do that comparison. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So if you have further questions, please find Rob or Chris during the break. And thanks to both speakers.